Hello and welcome to another week of the AFTB TV preview show. We're here at a very misty Vitality Stadium and I'm joined by Chris Temple to go through all of the week's action. Coming up on today's show, we'll be looking back at Monday's 2-1 win over Crystal Palace here at Vitality Stadium. We'll also be taking a look at what happened when we went out and about with Junior Stanislas. And finally, we'll be previewing this weekend's game against Watford at Vicarage Road. But there's only one place to start, and that's with last week's 2-1 win against Crystal Palace here at Vitality Stadium. Let's take a look at the short highlights. Nil-nil ball with Palace, Smith ball into the penalty area, picked up by Wilson, square to Brooks, left foot in, and David Brooks with his first Premier League goal, and it's an absolute peach! Onto his left foot, in off the underside of the bar, into the top corner, he's making waves in the top flight is David Brooks, 1-0 Cherries. Well, quite an amazing move, and it was Adam Smith who put the cross in with his left foot, drove it across the face of goal. I think it was it Callum or, or Callum who held the ball up. Zahar gets a fortunate break of the ball and now Van Arnholt ghosting in left hand side. Right footed shot! That is some equaliser from Patrick Van Arnholt who has lashed it into the same top corner that David Brooks found earlier on and Palace have been threatening at the start of this second half and they get the goal that their possession deserves. 55th minute, 1-1. Well, yeah, you have to say, it, it seemed likely the way they were going and it was the pass through. Just the people to beat, of course, but he didn't have a lot of angle, decided to go with power and smashes it in the top corner. Just a little suspicion of upside, I think he was just a yard. The substitutes they brought on have got extra defensive artillery here. It's a penalty, is it? It is a penalty! It's Lerma who's gone down, Bournemouth have got a penalty! Yellow card in there as well for Sacco. Well, the referee had just literally warned them. And Lerma has gone down, face down on the edge of the penalty area. And he has won the Cherries a spot kick. And, and Stanislas has got the ball. Let's have a look at the replay here, Willows. It comes in, Lerma's got it, he's just got a clout, a flailing arm from Sacco. Can Stanislas possibly win it? Right footed, in the net, down the middle. Junior Stanislas, two and two. And is that enough for Bournemouth against Crystal Palace? Bournemouth two, Crystal Palace one. Well, there we go. Goals from David Brooks and Junior Stanislas saw the Cherries pick up another three points. And Chris, what a night it was under the lights. That's four Premier League wins now. Home form going really well, isn't it? Yeah, um, it was. It took some character to come back in the second half because Palace came out firing in that second half, got the goal at the good time. Oh, I know it was offside, but uh, you know, got that goal and we're on top pretty much for the good 10 or 15 minutes afterwards and Bournemouth did well to hang on actually there at 1-1 and I think that gave them the platform then to push on change the system obviously which really made a difference in the second half bringing Dan Gosling on just solidified things in midfield a bit um, and allowed you know just to regain a bit of a foothold in the game and then obviously right at the end Junior popping up with the penalty um, a couple of sort of standout performances I thought Jefferson Lerma had, a, had his best game for Bournemouth um, really mixed it I know he got in a scuffle at the end there which is probably uh, I guess what I think people were expecting to see a bit sooner than they have but I thought he was all over the pitch putting his foot in he gave the ball away a couple of times but that's going to happen um, but I thought just as a presence in the centre of midfield he was starting to show the sort of thing that I think Bournemouth fans expected they'd been signed for um, just a bit sort of combative and mixing it up a little bit and playing some nice balls as well so I thought he was really good um, David Brooks had a great great first half faded a bit in the, the few minutes he had um, before half time and then before he got took off um, and obviously the fullbacks for shutting down those wingers you know Wilfred Zaha and Andros Townsend um, what a threat they are Simon Francis and Adam Smith let's not forget out of position at left back defending on his wrong foot effectively um, I thought they, they were both excellent um, so all in all yeah great performance and you know those two points the difference between a point and three in those sort of games you know the table I think there's probably 
you'd be 10th instead of 7th. So from that point of view, yeah, a huge little, uh, huge Monday night, that one. And what is it about home form? The Cherries have won five here now this season and are unbeaten in six. I think it's been a real contributing factor to the general momentum because with cup draws, Bournemouth have played six games at home and only three away so far this season. So, um, you know, a couple of those haven't gone that well. So the home form really has been an opportunity to build up that momentum. Uh, as we said last week or the week before, they've scored two in every home game they've played at least. Um, which is, you know, so the fans are coming expecting goals. Uh, yeah, so I think I think playing regularly here, having those couple of home cup games as well, just to keep the ball rolling uh, in terms of home form. And this is, place has already become a, a difficult place for opposition teams to come. So they've been entertaining games. We don't see many boring games here. Um, and this season has certainly lived up to that sort of a entertaining tag. And as you say, under the lights, it's, it's, it's become a, a synonymous with good Bournemouth performances down the years. For some reason, I don't know what it is about darkness or the extra special atmosphere or, or whatever it does, but it does seem to, uh, to always provide some entertainment. And that win on Monday now up to seventh in the Premier League. Yeah, and this weekend, you know, sixth against seventh. Someone in the press conference earlier mentioned the two teams pressing for a Champions League place, which of course is inevitably what people will start saying sort of lightheartedly, I guess. But I think it's, it's good for the league to see Watford in sixth and Bournemouth in seventh at the moment. You know, even Leicester and Wolves, you know, in the, in the top edge echelons of the table as well. Um, either side of Manchester United who have had a, their struggles. So, you know, only a couple of points behind Chelsea and, and Tottenham and Arsenal and teams like that. I know it's only seven games, but they always say the table starts to even itself out as you get towards eight, nine, ten games. So it's a great platform. And when you look at the points column, 13, that's a third of the way pretty much towards the Magic 40. And you know, only seven games of the season gone. So from that point of view, and I know that's what the message will be, is that they've ticked off a big chunk of the points they want to achieve. Um, get a few more of them in the bag while the fixtures are maybe on their side slightly. And hopefully uh, sort of then that when December comes and there's uh, some trickier looking fixtures on the horizon, um, there's already a, a good points all in the bag. And you mentioned Jefferson Lerma. There were a host of players that, that performed brilliantly on Monday. And Nathan Ake was, was another one. Nathan Ake, I should have mentioned him in the first, uh, the first batch, really. He got man of the match. Um, I've I seen him this morning. He's, still got a, he's got a broken nose, actually, from uh, that chance where he, I think he headbutted the back of uh, Jordan Ayew uh, when, when winning a header. So, yeah, Nathan Ake, the sort of uh, <laughs> the pretty boy, if you like, of the team. He's, uh, he's got a bit of a, a big conk at the moment, for sure. But he's going to get it reset, he was telling me. So, uh, yeah, but he had a great game, you know, physically. We know he's not the tallest, but he's got such a spring on him. He's so athletic he reads the game so well he's always seems to be half a yard ahead and again I'm repeating myself but him and Steve Cook have really formed a great partnership and again speaking to both of those players individually over the last couple of weeks they both talk about how much work they're doing as a pair um, Eddie Howe has taken them off as a centre half you know looking at clips of them telling them as a pair what they should be doing so they really have gelled together as the, the first choice pair and you know it, it's a, in a way it's a shame to signal Nathan Ake out above Steve Cook because they both sort of dealt with that physical threat but yeah Nathan Ake was one once again, superb, and I hope he gets a chance with Holland in the coming up international break. They're playing Germany and, and Belgium, I think, so um, two big games for them. And it'd be nice to see him get some minutes because the last time he went, he just sat on the bench because Holland have got a few defensive options at the moment. And another player that played on Monday night is Junior Stanislas. We seem to be talking about him every week now and uh, back on the score sheet as well. Well, he keeps popping up with key contributions. That's why, um, again, you know, off the bench, and that was his first touch of the game to put the penalty in the back of the net. So, it, again, it takes some, uh, some strong will from him to say, I've only just come on, but I feel ready to... To, uh, to take the penalty at a match-defining moment as well. It's a cool penalty down the middle as well, not just taking it, but that little sort of dink down the middle, he didn't try and blast it. Again, if the goalkeeper stands up, which they never do, um, and just, he'd just catch it, wouldn't he? But uh, yeah, Junior, he, he didn't have to do a lot in that game because he only came on very late, but what he did do uh, was the key match-turning moment. So again, we talk about choices on the wing. Um, I see no reason to change the ones that have been starting, but um, it just gives Eddie another option. Well, earlier this week, the AFCB TV cameras went out and about with Junior Stanislas and he talks about set pieces. Free kicks in and around the box, I'll say I usually take. Obviously, Diego's coming now. Diego's got a good left foot. Um, at the time last year, me and Chaz used to stand around it and given the, where the free kick was, maybe he might take it or I might take it. But always anywhere around the box, I feel confident taking them. Well, there we go. That was Junior Stanislas talking about set pieces and you can see the full out and about on AFCB TV for free. Now, Chris, free kicks. We've seen him score one last year against West Brom and it's great to have him on the pitch just to be able to do that, isn't it? Yeah, we've seen Rico have a couple of goes. He's obviously been uh, struggling with a little bit of a, a hamstring injury and maybe, you know, he might struggle to get back in this weekend with the way that Adam Smith played as well. So to have Junior on free kicks, I mean, there will be a day one day when Simon Francis scores. Um, that will happen. I don't know when it is, whether it will be in this universe or the next. Um, he had a go last week down the south end of the ground and 
I mean, it ended up nearer the corner flag than the goal. Um, I'm not sure he got the best ball from the wee man from the free kick. So Simon Francis will keep having it. He'll keep popping up occasionally. He's a bit more. Junior's got the the creative, as my colleague Willow on Radio Solo would say. He's got the suave on the free kicks. Francis is a bit more just hammer it basically. So I think one will burst the net, but I don't know when it's going to be. Uh, we've seen the wee man try and clip a couple. Um, so there's a few people that, that tend to get themselves in and around. I'm sure Lewis Cook always hovers around, hoping that when he's on the pitch, and he's another one we should have mentioned earlier on, by the way, who I thought was good uh, on Monday night having come in from the cold um, but yeah Junior with his free kicks he, he will be to the front of the queue I would imagine now and we talked about the many players that can take free kicks we've also seen four different players take penalties this year yeah uh, with varying degrees of success obviously Callum Wilson took the first one and missed it uh, and then Joshua King scored a couple Jordan Ibe scored one in the League Cup Junior Stanislas has scored one now as well um, some people get a bit funny about you know moving the penalty takers around and things I mean it doesn't it doesn't really bother me as long as it goes in the net to be honest it doesn't matter who's taking it um, of course the, the the situation has been that Joshua King wasn't on the pitch for example the other day so he would have taken it if he'd been on the pitch who knows if it had been the same result I'm not sure I think Callum Wilson unfortunately in missing has, has ended up four or five people down the queue now uh, you don't get many second chances if you miss one I think you tend to disappear from the radar for a bit so uh, I think Joshua King is very, very much still the taker but if he's not on the pitch then there's uh, obviously two or three people who'd fancy themselves to step up yeah and of course last year it was at Vicarage Road that Junior picked up his injury it would almost be like a fairy tale if he were to go back there and score this year exactly exactly right yeah it was and it was that innocuous wasn't it bone on bone injury I remember it right on the halfway line down underneath us where he, uh, he, he ended up hobbling off but yeah it was a great game there last year um, Jermaine Defoe obviously got the last minute equaliser uh, two teams that have been very hard to separate down the years lots of draws Bournemouth have never beaten Watford in the Premier League, which is a, an amazing st st statistic, really, when you think of the two clubs being very closely matched. So, uh, yeah, Vicarage are not only always an easy easy place for people to go, and they've started the season really well. They've just, um, the radar's uh, just sort of started to slip a little bit, but they've had some tough fixtures in the last three or four. So uh, they'll, they'll see this as a chance to get back to winning ways, I'm sure. Well, last time out, it was a 2-2 draw at Vicarage Road. Let's take a look at the short highlights. Nil-nil, taken short, Pereira swung in by Holobats towards Prudel, volleyed by Firmenia and deflected past Begovic. Stanislas with a couple of step-overs, drives it for goal, good save, loops to the back post and goes behind. Both teams claiming they want the decision, it is a penalty. I think it was Jordan Aib. Well, the goalkeeper saved it with his left hand, it looped up into yeah, the sky and then Holobats at the back post has punched it away with his hand. So it is a clear handball, it's a great spot from the officials. It's King then, for the Cherries to level it up before half-time, which he does. Rolls it into the bottom left corner and Bournemouth do find themselves on terms. Dini plays it into the box, finds Hughes, holds it up, the shot's goalwards, and it's Watford back in front through Pereira. Daniels from the free kick, lofted into the penalty, Ake helps it on down the centre, and the Cherries are in here, and the Cherries have equalised! And you John said it would be Jermaine Defoe, John Williams, and of course, Johnny on the spot, Jermaine Defoe pops up with the equaliser, deep into added time, and once again, never right off this Eddie Howe team. Well, it was Joshua King with the penalty that day, as well as Jermaine Defoe with a last-minute equaliser. And Chris, it's not going to be another easy game on, a, on Saturday. What for the flying? Started very well. Um, yeah, as I say, very tough place to go traditionally. They didn't make many massive signings over the summer. They obviously made a load of money on Richarlison, selling him for 40 million to Everton. But in terms of the players they brought in, they were sort of a couple for two or three million. Ben Foster, they brought in in goal, who's obviously gone straight into the team, who's a million, but very experienced, uh, obviously former England keeper as well. So they've got largely the same nucleus of the team that Bournemouth will know from the last couple of years. The one player who's probably stood out this season who hasn't necessarily caught the headlines before is the Argentinian Roberto Pereira, who scored in that game, obviously we just saw 
um, last season, who's got a couple of goals this season. Troy Deeney obviously always physically offers a threat. Um, you know, he, he's he's good at what he's good at. He's you know he's, he's un unfashionable probably, um, but certainly Steve Cook and Nathan Ake will will find themselves in a, a physical battle again. Um, so yeah, and the likes of you know Will Hughes, he always seems to have a decent game against Bournemouth as well. Um, but a lot, a lot of familiar names from the last couple of seasons. So not a much changed squad. Um, obviously they changed the manager a million times in the last uh, last few years. But Javi Garcia certainly seems to have uh, have got them starting well. Yeah. And on paper, it's a very evenly matched game. Both teams have won four, they've drawn one, and they've lost two. Yeah, and going back down the years, I think someone just mentioned in the press conference it was two wins in 28 for Bournemouth against Watford or one win in 14. They're not my stats, so if they're wrong, don't uh, clip this up for next week. But uh, generally, not a great record against Watford. Um, they had a great win, obviously, at home over uh, Spurs in the league. Uh, again, their early fixtures were quite favourable. They did have Tottenham in there, so to beat them, they then went and lost to them in the League Cup on pens, obviously. But in the last three games, they've had some tough games, so no real surprise that they've struggled to get results in those. Um, but a bit like Bournemouth needing to take advantage against some of the teams that they'll be in and around at the end of the season. That's why I think Watford will see this as a good chance to get back to winning ways. Um, so don't I wouldn't say to read too much. By all accounts, they played pretty well in the couple of the games they lost to the big guns in recent weeks. Um, so I don't think we should read too much into the fact there's uh, been a couple of draws and losses rather than the, the Ws this time. And a real boost for Eddie Howe is that there's no fresh injury concerns going into the game. And Charlie Daniels, of course, came back in the, uh, the reserve under-21s in midweek. So that's uh, really positive as well. I think he's uh, probably too soon this weekend. But again, with Adam Smith doing so well at left back, you, you, we talk about Charlie Daniels having competition from Diego Rico. He probably wasn't expecting to have competition from Adam Smith for the left back role. Um, but as well as Smith, he did against Palace. You know, he would be, I would imagine, um, first choice again there this time round. Um, but yeah, so with Charlie back and Junior Stanislas back and Dan Gosling now back as well, um, there's only one or two others carrying minor knocks. So he's got a lot of options all of a sudden now. And there's very few injuries in the squad, as you say. Um, some choices to be made, albeit there probably aren't difficult choices because the team's playing well. So the, the team is, is largely picking itself at the moment. The one I'd be interested to see is um, uh, midfield-wise, whether he, uh, he opts to, to change anything there. Uh, the, the Lerma and Lewis-Cook partnership that we thought would start the season eventually got its chance against Palace and was very good. Um, the wee man obviously has played every game. International break coming up where he'll probably feature for Scotland. So I just wonder if the wing position, he might freshen something up. But again, I, I, there's no reason to. And you did mention that international break there. How important is it to get a good result going into it without a game for two weeks? Yeah, always. And when, you know, the first game back is Southampton here. So that's a, a tasty game. You want to go into that with a bit of confidence as well, I'm sure, which the way the two teams are playing at the moment. I know Saints had a good League Cup win in midweek, but, you know, in terms of the Premier League, they just haven't got going at all yet. So, uh, yeah, to, to get something from Watford, you know, a point would be a good result there for sure. Um, to have something to take into that international break. Um, you, the last thing you want to be doing is stewing on a, a bad performance or a, a, something that's gone wrong for two weeks. Uh, particularly as a lot of the players now stay here as well. There's only a handful of internationals who go away, maybe five or six who probably end up going. Asmir Begovic obviously has been called up again. Um, as we record this, Nathan Ake is waiting to hear if he's in the Holland squad. I'm sure he will be. Um, but yeah, so for, for the players that are hanging around here, you don't want to be hanging around in the doldrums for a couple of weeks. Well, that's all we've got time for today. If you are going to Watford, please be aware of delays on the train, but otherwise do have a safe journey. We'll see you next time as we preview the game against Southampton.